Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Robert Tasker, Professor of Neurology and Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School and Director of Neurocritical Care at Boston Children's Hospital. Today I'm being joined by uh, Professor Sunit Singhi, who is Chairman of Pediatrics in Chandigarh. He is also the current President of the World Federation of Pediatric Intensive and Critical Care Societies. The reason for us meeting today is that Sunit Singhi wrote uh, a paper with his group that appeared in Critical Care Medicine last year in the August issue, and I wrote the editorial. And as I was writing that editorial, I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great to be able to talk to Sunit and ask him about raised intracranial pressure and central nervous system infection. Sunit, I wondered if you could start your talk by telling us where it is that you work and what is the landscape of central nervous system infection in your area of India. Thank you, Robert. It's really an honor to be here and especially speaking with you because you are one of those who had done so much work in neurocritical care. Uh, I, would I would be happy to answer all of the questions that you would like to raise, but let me start by saying that Chandigarh is north of India, and I work in an institute which is particularly created for education and research, and we have only postgraduate education there. I had been privileged to get a position there and move, on, move there. CNS infections in India is one of the most important diseases that come to emergency as well as ICU. And we see all kind of uh, conditions, bacterial meningitis, meningoencephalitis, viral meningitis, tubercular meningitis, cerebral malaria, brain abscesses. But by far it's encephalitis and bacterial meningitis that are the common. And in my emergency, of all patients that we see, which is about 15,000 now, but from six years ago when we were seeing 12,000 patients a year, it was still about 20% of all patients had CNS infections. And among them, there were meningitis and encephalitis in equal proportion. But when it comes to ICU, a lot more of meningitis get transferred there as they being treatable and encephalitis remains a close second. In 2010 and 11, we had uh, about 1,100 patients coming to the ICU, among which 222 were CNS infections. So you can see roughly 20% of all patients again, and 140 were encephalitis. And so now the scenario had changed from uh, bacterial meningitis to more encephalitic illnesses and partly it is because of immunization and all. But what we have interestingly also some rickettsial infections and a persistent HSV, but most common is still Japanese encephalitis. Among the bacterial meningitis, we have pneumococcus and as the commonest organism now. So it's a tremendous workload of all that what we do in ICU and that's why it is natural that we remain interested in this. And we see a large spectrum of various encephalitis. But I would like to say here that it's not just we. Globally, encephalitis remains one of the most common infectious diseases and incidents varying from somewhere between two and a half to 8.8 .8 per 100,000 population. So it's a disease that concerns a large part of the globe. And if you look at this graph that shows distribution of Japanese encephalitis, you can see the half the world, most of India, China, and eastern part of the world are endemic to it. And that's the one of the commonest CNS infection now, causing high morbidity as well as mortality. And that's why it remains a big concern. Thank you, Sunit. I wonder if I could now turn to our audience and ask that you also have a discussion. Could you please put the city where you're based and the country? So here are the questions. 
What is the landscape of central nervous system infection in your part of the world? And what are the most common central nervous system infections that you see in children coming to your intensive care unit? Sunit, I wonder if I could now return to you and ask you to tell us about the problem of raised intracranial pressure in central nervous system infection. And in particular, if you could give us a few comments or guidelines about doing lumbar punctures in this group of patients. Central nervous system infections are pretty devastating. I mean, most patients, they come with besides so many other things with raised intracranial pressure. And those which come to ICU, up to 80% of them would have raised intracranial pressure. And this is also the reason why they die. In fact, cerebral herniation can occur in them in eight hours' time. And one third of all deaths occur in 48 hours in these patients. Cerebral herniation has been also seen in these patients and 30% of those on autopsy. So it makes it a very important disease that we need to manage. Given the total magnitude of the disease, this is a very high mortality that we intend to take care and try to save as many patients. Even in, <coughs> in encephalitis, it is even worse. Most of the patients with a intracranial pressure above 25, about 50% of them would die. And this is data from India. And about other 70% with a poor outcome would have had suffered a herniation syndrome. So treating raised intracranial pressure in these patients become very important. And we know that even in those who are not necessarily apparently having raised ICP or posturing, uh, they may be simply unconscious. And across the board, if you look at uh, this study from United Kingdom a long time ago, out of 35 patients, 33 had raised intracranial pressure. I was unable to get hold of one of the graphs from our previous study that we did in Ajmer in 1982. But there again, we had almost similar number of patients with raised intracranial pressure or high opening pressure at the lumbar puncture. And therefore, to perform lumbar puncture in these patients, uh, for me, would be difficult if a child has a GCS below it or if there are apparent focal findings. In such patients, I would get a CT scan done because papilledema and other signs are going to be very late in their appearance. So if I'm satisfied that patient is not the raised ICP under control, then only I would go for an a lumbar puncture. And in most of such patients who have come to our ICU, we wouldn't have done a lumbar puncture in first 24 hours. It's only after first 24 to 48 hours. And the reason is to save these patients from any ill effect of raised intracranial pressure. We also know that this pressure is very likely to be high in these patients because of cerebral edema, infarction, or a combination of these. And if you look at these, images that I have brought from some of our patients, even a half of the brain may be infarcted at that time. So edema can be quite massive. And in such patients, what is needed is to give them treatment, treat the raised intracranial pressure, rather than a lumbar puncture, which will not give much of the information to begin. However, once the raised intracranial pressure is under control, we would do a lumbar puncture because we do want to get an etiology, particularly for virus, and the empiric therapies that we have started, we would even, should we continue or should we discontinue, would depend on those findings. So lumbar puncture does have a place, but not immediately. Thank you. I'd like to turn to the audience again. Uh, just to remind you, please write the city and country from uh, which your unit is based. Um, there have been three guideline documents for central nervous system infection and the place of lumbar puncture, and you'll see those on the slide. But the question that I'd like to pose to you is, what is your view on lumbar puncture in critically ill children with suspected CNS infection? I'm sure this will raise a lot of discussion because it's a controversial topic, and we would be very interested in what you have to say about this.
So Sunit, with that wonderful um, introduction, uh, now I'd like to ask you, why is it that you became interested in studying cerebral edema and raised intracranial pressure in central nervous system infection? You know, this had been one of the areas that I always was fascinated, but at the same time, I was not sure the way people had been treating CNS CS infections in the past found favor with me. In 1982, we did a study which, which is shown here, and what I found in that study was with raised intracranial pressure, there were, the blood pressures were high in these patients. And those who had high blood pressure, once the disease started coming down, they started improving. So very clearly, when any treatment that was being offered, like diuretics or fluid restriction, they are going to adversely affect that blood pressure. And I was therefore not happy with this. And then we did one study uh, on role of fluid restriction, which was published in 1995 in Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal, where we showed clearly that if we reduce fluid intake, of fluid administration to these patients in the first 48 hours, the outcome was adversely affected and they had higher mortality and sequelae. The third thing is uh, what we observed during this period was our patients who received mannitol, and this is unpublished data that I am showing here, where patients receiving mannitol with acute meningitis had three times higher mortality than those who did not. And further looking at it, those patients with men who had mannitol and had increased urine output, which we defined as more than three mil per hour, had even higher mortality, which in other words meant to us that if you deplete them of fluid or reduce their circulating volume, the outcome is likely to be adverse. And then, of course, the information from the literature that initially there is lower blood flow, which is related to increased intracranial pressure, and also these experimental studies, which shows that autoregulation is impaired in experimental animals as well as patients with meningitis. And here, their cerebral blood flow becomes dependent on what is the blood pressure, and therefore they became quite logical that if you manage blood pressure well, you can improve cerebral blood flow and reduce the cerebral injury. And that was the whole rationale for conducting our studies. So, Sunit, that's very interesting. And um, would it be fair to say that taking treatments that were developed for traumatic brain injury and translating them to a practice in patients with central nervous system infection was essentially fundamentally wrong? Well, I would not say fundamentally wrong, but I think we cannot directly apply those strategies to children with CNS infections. In CNS infections, the pathology is very different. One, there is a global involvement not focal, there is edema, there is impairment of uh, CSF formation and absorption, which doesn't happen with head injury, and also the cerebral autoregulation. And therefore, it, is, it, it, it should be viewed differently than head injury. Thank you. I'd like to turn to the audience again, and uh, please, when you respond, the city uh, from where your unit is based, as well as the country. So you've heard Sunit talk about the treatments that they used historically in Chandigarh. I wonder if you could communicate with us, what therapies do you use in patients with central nervous system infection? Do you use blood pressure management? Do you use hyperosmolar therapies? Uh, do you fluid restrict? So Sunit, now we come to the time where we'd really like to hear about your study that appeared in the August issue of Critical Care Medicine. 
and what you did and what you have learned from it. We, based on rationale that I mentioned earlier, we were not happy treating patients the way it was going on. And we decided that we should treat these patients in a way that we improve cerebral perfusion and target cerebral blood flow rather than try to reduce the cerebral edema and raise intracranial pressure in, in that sense. In 2007, we therefore took, undertook a pilot study to see if we can improve cerebral perfusion in these patients. And if that is feasible, does it make a difference? And in that pilot study, we had 20 patients in whom we tried to increase the perfusion pressure by giving fluids and vasopressors, which was epinephrine and dopamine. And if it still didn't work, then we did use high osmolar diuretic, mannitol at that time. And what we found at that time is this. What is shown in this graph is Patients in whom we try to improve the cerebral perfusion pressure by using fluid and ionotropes had a remarkable improvement in their perfusion pressure by at least about 10 millimeters. But what was very interesting is that in these patients with improvement in perfusion pressure, the intracranial pressure, the ICP which was being monitored, also came down. And that to me reflected the reappearance of autoregulation in these patients and that or that increased intracranial pressure was partly because of decreased cerebral blood flow, whatever the reason, whether increased intracranial pressure or because of the disease itself. But certainly improving cerebral perfusion pressure resulted in decrease in intracranial pressure. And then we thought that we should now implement it across the board and do a larger randomized study, and which we started in 2008. And from 2008 to 11, we undertook that study, in which we enrolled 110 patients with CNS infections. And in these patients, our target cerebral perfusion pressure was again dependent on this previous study, where we have shown three groups of patients those who survived without sequelae and those who died, and then the intermediate group, those who survived with sequelae. Clearly, patients who had a cerebral perfusion pressure above 60 had an intact survival. And so in this study, we tried to maintain a cerebral perfusion pressure of 60 millimeters. And we enrolled 55 patients each in both these groups, which were of varying etiology, but acute meningitis or encephalitis of any etiology. In cerebral perfusion pressure targeted group, we try to improve the blood pressure up to 95th centile if needed, so that we could get a perfusion pressure above 60. And if this didn't work with fluid and ionotrope, then only we would use a osmotic diuretic in these patients. Whereas in other group, we manage them in traditional way as we try to reduce the intracranial pressure with use of diuretics and if necessary for an acute elevation hyperventilation. In all of them, a intracranial pressure, intra, intraparenchymal tra pressure transducer was placed and we were could, monitoring it. Could I just interrupt and ask, in the ICP strategy group, what was the blood pressure target that you accepted, or perfusion pressure target that you accepted in those patients? In, in, in ICP-targeted group, we accepted anything which was within normal range. That is, anything above fifth centile was all right with us. So just to make absolutely clear for our audience, the CPP strategy group, you were targeting a blood pressure close to the 90th or 95th percentile. Whatever was needed. Whatever was needed. But in the ICP strategy group, providing the blood pressure was above the 5th percentile, you didn't intervene. 
Is, yeah. is that correct? That's right. But as I would show, in this group also, the average blood pressures remained around 50th centile. And there's no episode of hypotension that occurred. So in these, both the groups, this is the flow chart which shows uh, how we enrolled the patients. And they, these two groups were quite similar. And etiology was also similar. There were patients with acute meningitis, 20, 22 in each group. And then there were men, these encephalitis up, which Japanese encephalitis was the commonest. So what was most impressive in this was that mortality reduction in patients who received cerebral perfusion pressure targeted therapy was almost half of what was seen in ICP targeted group. 90 days mortality, as you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curve, there's a tremendous difference in both. And this graph shows Glasgow Coma Scale scores in both the groups at 72, 48, and 24 hours. And at each stage, there is a significantly better number or higher number in CPP targeted group, which had a score above eight. The group on cerebral perfusion pressure also had reduced IC, ICU stay, reduced ventilators requirement, and overall reduced uh, requirement for other therapies. Now, what is again fascinating and that one would like to learn from this is that when we increased cerebral perfusion pressure, the gain in reduction in ICP was something like our previous study. So although we had improved the blood pressure, let's say by five or six or 10, the total improvement in perfusion pressure was much more than what we achieved with only elevating blood pressure. And that shows that if you improve cerebral perfusion, perhaps their regulation, regulation, autoregulation is coming back, which didn't happen in the ICP group. In ICP group, whatever reduction in the ICP that we achieved, uh, that much was the improvement in the perfusion pressure. And I've come to this graph which shows patients who survived and patients who died. And here something very fascinating is seen in this second graph that you see. The pressures or the perfusion pressures in patients with ICP therapy and perfusion pressure in those CPP targeted therapy, they are touching each other. But the group with cerebral perfusion pressure that died had pressures almost same as the ICP group uh, which survived. And that is something which made us again thinking that why everyone with the cerebral perfusion pressure targeted therapy, although we have achieved a good perfusion pressure, was dying. And therefore, then we looked at a, these patients' data, which is not published yet, on the line of their cerebral reactivity. Yeah. I, I think that's really interesting. I know that in the correspondence that followed the publication of the paper, uh, a number of people have talked about the whole literature on uh, CPP opt and cerebral reactivity. We will include uh, on the next slide a list of the uh, references to that correspondence. Now a brief question for our audience and again please write the city and country uh, where your unit is based. Having seen these data, uh, has your treatment or management changed in patients with raised intracranial pressure complicating central nervous system infection? Sonic, before I ask you uh, and pin you down on exactly what you learned from your study, uh, one of the things that I thought about as I was writing the editorial and commented at the end of my editorial was could you in fact manage these patients without an ICP monitor but just with an arterial line or a blood pressure cuff and target the 90th and 95th percentile for age with blood pressure management? Why do we need an ICP monitor? 
you are perfectly on point of Tusker. In fact, we needed to monitor ICP because we wanted to have this point clearly established. But in essence, what has been done is only to improve the blood pressures to a higher level and not knowing exactly how much one would require to raise to maintain a certain perfusion pressure, it was necessary to monitor both ICP as well as, intra, uh, as, well as uh, arterial pressure. But if you translate this data into practice, even if you don't have an ICP monitor, raising blood pressure to 90 to 95th percentile would be good enough to save most of the brains from childhood infection and definitely to reduce the mortality. So this study should be useful to everyone who is managing intracranial pressure. What it brings out, the fundamental difference in treating the patients now that you were, we were earlier using osmotic diuretics, reducing intravascular volume, hoping that it will reduce intracranial volume, but the better way is to improve cerebral perfusion and once cerebral perfusion is improved by improving the blood pressure, it will come down. And therefore, ICP monitoring is not a necessity. Even if you don't have an intra-arterial monitoring, that is okay because if you can monitor blood pressures manually or a non-invasive method, that could be good enough. Right. Thank you. And now I'd like to press you on uh, the key things that you learned. Yes. So after this, we got more interested in knowing why some of the patients who received perfusion pressure targeted therapy hasn't improved. And we tried to learn from the data further. So we took out each patient's data and created these graphs that you can see here, that how the rela relationship between intracranial pressure and the blood pressure was maintained in these patients. And we got these three different kind of graphics. One where blood pressure increased resulted in an increase in intracranial pressure. In other, there was a negative slope. And in some, the slope remained stable. And we took a value of R square more than 2% on either side as determinant of the slope. And on basis of that, we divided patients into two groups, pressure stable and pressure, re pressure reactive. And then second group of pressure passive, where increase in blood pressure was resulting in increase ICP. And in these two groups of ICP and CPP, we tried to find the time over which the ICP was above 20 and CPP was below 60. We label these as the ICP insult and CPP insult. And if you can see in this graph, the ICP insult and CPP insult both were higher in ICP group. And that explains why the mortality in ICP group remained high. But there is also a significant number of patients in CPP group where there is ICP insult and CPP insult has remained. And this is the group which to us appeared is those which are pressure passive and we analyze the data further on basis of pressure reactivity. And what we found that whether it's ICP group or CPP group, patients who had pressure stable or active graphics over they are the ones who had a better outcome. In fact, the, out, the mortality was almost twice in patients who had pressure passive uh, status. And when we looked at it further at in, on, in terms of improvement in their consciousness score, even GCS at 48 hours are much better in those who had pressure stable re relationship. Within group C also, ICP group and CPP group, when we analyze pressure stable and pressure passive, it, was, it is really interesting if you look at this graph, that pressure stable ones have a much better outcome, much lower mortality 
In fact, if you look at the pressure passive in ICP group, more than half of them have died, which is largest proportion in the whole of this study group. And in CPP group, also the mortality in pressure passive group is almost four times as compared to pressure stable ones. So I think if in future we are able to understand these patients in with respect to their pressure relationship in ICP and blood pressure, uh, we may be able to identify the group in which this therapy of improving the blood pressure can be optimized to, for the best results. And if we can do it without measuring intracranial pressure, then only it can be applied everywhere. But till then, I think what we have learned is most patients would benefit by raising blood pressure and with the hope that this would improve the cerebral perfusion. And in some way, it doesn't improve, at least it won't do any harm. But we also know from data from the published studies that cerebral perfusion pressure alone is not enough. And it, is, it necessarily doesn't result in improved oxygen delivery in every patient. And therefore, that group of patients we need to identify for the next uh, work. So thank you, Sunit. Um, one of the things that um, always intrigues me when I read papers is, what does this person actually do? If I was to visit their unit, what actually happens? And so I've read your paper, I've written a bit about it, I've read the correspondence. So now I want to hear from you. So a patient with suspected central nervous system infection and cerebral edema appears on your unit, is mechanically ventilated. What actually happens today? So a patient comes to the emergency first, and there we would stabilize the patient. And if there are signs of raised ICP or the coma score is below 8, then we would also get a imaging done to see if there's anything else other than cerebral edema or, and we'll get him to the ICU. In the meanwhile, we'll also get a blood sample to rule out malaria because cerebral malaria is an important issue. And these days, getting a, a rapid test is more or less within an hour or two, we can have that whole answer. In this time, we will have the preliminary investigations and prepare for ICP monitoring and perfusion pressure targeted therapy. So if there is raised ICP, which is being suspected, and we have a very low threshold for treating it, if the Glasgow Coma Scale score is below eight, we take it as a sign of raised intracranial pressure, besides all other signs like posturing. And in these patient, while being prepared for ICP monitoring, uh, we would start uh, empiric therapy for covering meningitis. If they have focal signs, we will also start them on acyclovir. And once the ICP is in, we'll push for pressure-targeted therapy. But at all time, we would try to maintain blood pressures above 50th centile in any case before the ICP is inserted. And so we are not averse to using so, a fluid bolus. So sorry to interrupt you. You said 50th percentile, but yet in your study, you targeted 90th to the 95th percentile. So, so is that what I would find if I visited your unit? No, no this is the Im, Im, in the emergency. Okay. This is in the emergency. Once the patient has come to the ICU and ICP is inserted, we would target the 90th, 95th, whatever is needed to get to a cerebral perfusion pressure of 60. Uh, it would be unusual that a patient wouldn't get an ICP monitoring in our unit. But as I said, if I were to manage this patient without an ICU, I would try to keep the blood pressures on the higher side and never let them slip below the normal, uh, below the 50th. I'd like to turn to the audience again and uh, please uh, respond with the uh, city and country from uh, where you're writing. Two questions. Do you use ICP monitoring or can you find someone to put an ICP monitor in these patients? And two, what is your strategy now? Having heard uh, the discussion from uh, Professor Singhi, uh, what is your uh, management uh, for these patients? 
Thank you very much for joining us in this conversation that we've had with Professor Sunit Singhi. Sunit, I'd really like to thank you for such a, a wonderful description of your paper and your uh, views on intracranial pressure in CNS infection. It's been really interesting for me. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. It is really an honor and pleasure talking about all this, what we could share with the rest of the world. Thank you.